there, people all over the world. My name is Dustin Dolby, and today I'm going to use this IKEA lampshade as a product photography lighting modifier. So thumb up the video if you have time, and I'm going to explore how to shoot just small product in general with this. You know, most people use the larger one, but I got my hands on the smaller version. This is the Melody cone, and we took the light out. We're just going to use this literally as a modifier to kind of populate an entire storefront and make a case for a pretty low cost system. Now here's what I shot earlier, and this is by no means a watch tutorial. I shot this at f8, no focus stacking, but I want to show you how maybe you could have a one size fits all solution for shooting a ton of small prod and getting pretty consistent materials and background colors just using this, which I believe is like a $10 modifier. So I really want to explore this in the purview of having an entire storefront crafted. So here's a little storefront. And I think it served well as a run and gun way to get a pretty nice background look that's even straight out of the camera. So let's check out this red watch we're gonna be shooting today. And I'm also gonna explore color variants and how I approach that in post-production. Because being able to do that via a single exposure, I find is not only an efficient way to work, it gives a nice consumer experience when you switch between color options and you know the watch doesn't move. So you know I've seen people spend a whole lot more money for a worse result. So I thought there's no harm in showing you me taking my first crack at using this and just broadcasting you my behind the scenes. All right, everyone, I just locked down two of my favorite strip boxes, eight by 36 inch. Now you don't really need to use a strip box. I'll explain that in a minute. So we're using a standard white table. Um, actually, this table is from Ikea. Okay, darn, I swear I'm not shilling for Ikea, everyone, I promise. Let me just take a quick dark exposure to see if we are talking to the computer. Just a little delay here. Okay, there we go. And Actually, yeah, you'll notice that exposure is quite dark. That's the starting point. We're suffocating the ambient. So I think my settings are 1, 200th, F13, ISO 100, probably something like that. You know, such that that exposure you've seen does turn out to be dark. So don't need strip boxes necessarily. Speed lights are cool. Constant lights are cool on their own. Because the real magic here isn't the secondary modification. It's the beautiful utility of being able to suffocate our item with this Melody cone from Ikea. I swear I'm not showing for Ikea. And there's a tunnel vision that we'll be sure to take advantage of. Now, one thing I do like about these strip boxes is you can turn them sideways, okay? And that's really beautiful because from the top down, you can imagine how we could begin to kind of envelop the whole shape of the Melody cone here and really fulfill the chamber and fill it with bright, bright light. Now, I don't have this light on, I just have the far one on. Let's just take a little exposure and we'll discuss. Okay, pretty interesting. Uh, the 10 and 2 need to be adjusted, certainly, and there's a whole raft of little other cosmetic adjustments. A uh, big picture, even though this looks underwhelmingly dark, I think we can begin to appreciate the nature of the lighting and how soft it is coming through the Melody cone, especially where it's concentrated, like over here. Uh, like I said, this isn't a watch photography tutorial, tutorial, pardon me, and there's a whole raft of issues I'd have to tackle from this, but part of those imperfections do come as part and parcel of shooting a dollar store watch. Now, I want to give a shout out to someone in our group. I forget their name off the top of my head, but they were using in our Facebook group the large Melody cone with some pretty beautiful results. And please, if you want to see what the rest of the people who watch these tutorials are up to, check out our Facebook group and people post just gorgeous work they've been working on. Now let's turn on our right light here. And one thing you'll notice is the Melody cone does have a pretty interesting shape to it, but also it'll serve well to produce us a background that's usable in camera because often backgrounds are symmetrical and kind of clinical in e-commerce. Let's discuss this. So of course we can crop like this or choose a more square crop, which is pretty common in collections. And that's really nice because now you have a very sort of neutral canvas from which you can begin to churn out many shots to fill a storefront in a pretty simple way. And the symmetrical lighting goes a long way in building a sustainable canvas that you can use over and over again and get a pretty consistent look like we're able to enjoy here with the materials looking fairly pleasant. Okay, so I mean guys check this out. Look how simple this is. This is a completely symmetrical approach to this And when you see it from a bird-eye view you see how kind of simple and almost mathematical it becomes Now I should say actually I shot the original photo with the 18 to 55 kit lens covered in paint Just to give you just a little braggadocious language of the production value we have here at workflow One way to increase your perceived production value is to have a really strong handle on retouching this dollar store watch Which is hiding back there and not only cosmetic adjustments, but color variant edits. 
So hit that like button and join me in post-production. Okay, here we are live in post-production. I'm gonna really quickly show you a few things I would do to improve this shot and prepare it for color variants. Now I captured this in a bright and flat style on purpose, knowing I would try to digitally add some mood and some gradient later. So I'm gonna use a curves layer as my first tool. And I'm just gonna pull this down into a more moody look. And you see how effortless that is. It's kind of interesting because all this bright info, uh, which compromises the background, is almost not affected because it's so high up on the graph. So this is looking all right. But what I first like to do is pull it into the depths and that will reveal some pretty gnarly stuff going on in our canvas. Why don't we duplicate our canvas, control J, hit J to bring up our patch tool and start patching up some of this garbage. And this is something I often do, use a crazy layer to see things that the human eye almost even couldn't. Like I'm sure none of you realized any problems when it looked like that, and you can't even see the on and off difference, but with the layer, you know, it's just sort of pleasing to know you have a pretty clean output and your image looks as good as it can. It also reveals any glaring issues like, you know, areas down here that we'll patch up later. So I'm still going to use a curves layer, but not just as a utility, as an actual aesthetic choice. So I'm going to pull this a little moody, maybe too moody. But then what I'll do is I'll make another curves layer above it. I'm going to invert the mask for this one so it's invisible. And it's going to be, it's going to be a bright curves layer. And what I'll do is just get a white gradient radial mask and just skirt that near the logo. And you can put light wherever you want, really. They can start giving some directionality to the shape of the lighting. I'm just going to put some near the logo up here. And I, listen, I don't think things should always be shot like this or even often shot like this. But I just want to make a case for a super low-cost system where you shoot things bright, you shoot things flat, and then you pull it into a moody space and, you know, give it gradient, but it's digital gradient. From here, I want to make a few more adjustments. You see that this is sticking out so that we could freeze this on the 10 and 2. And even though I kind of missed the mark there, we still need to totally get rid of this. The way I would do that is duplicate this again. And if you have a different way to do this, let me know. Comment below. I'm really curious. But how I'd approach this is make a pretty simple selection right on the edge like that. And you see how that turned into a circle? That revealed to me that it had some feather, 39.8 pixels to be precise. And I don't want any feather, so I'll type that in as zero. Let me redo that. That looks pretty good. And I'll hit this button, which gives it a mask. Now, if you're new to Photoshop, what that did is just isolated it. And I'm going to click this button right here. It's a little chain link. And that will, well, it'll unlink them. So now what I can do, actually, I'll turn these off again, is I can begin to move this layer around. And I'm completely confined to the mask. But it doesn't move with the layer, which is really convenient. And we can take advantage of that. And how we will do that is with the position tool, on this layer with it unlinked, I'll start to hit left on my arrow pad and you'll see that actually moves the layer over and it almost looks like a real life animation and just tucks it in like that perfectly. And we'll zoom in and get a little more precise. And you know what, the mask's actually a little bit off. So what I'll do, I'll select the mask, I'll hit select, modify, contract, what does that look like? Two pixels. And ooh, that somehow went the wrong direction. So I'll select, modify, expand by two pixels. And I'll paste white into there. I know it's a bit more flush, but you still have a pretty stark line where that happens. And it's a huge benefit of keeping things smart because now I can introduce a bit of feather in this dialogue here. And look at that line just totally dissipate. I have to say that's pretty natural. Okay, that's making me happy. Now we can do that at a much more drastic level. And not that this necessarily calls for it. Like this is just ripped to heck over here. And, well, now that I look at this side, it's actually not that much better. But let's say you were in love with this side. Okay, like maybe this side was perfect. Or maybe you were trying to pay special attention to have symmetrical distances and the widths here. Sometimes that could be really tricky to line up. And sometimes it's easier just to flip half the image and sort of digitally symmetrize your photo. I'm pretty sure that's not a word. So what I'm going to do is feather. We'll do 40 pixels of feather. And I'll duplicate the base layer again. What I'll do is make a pretty simple rectangular selection. Keep in mind there's a lot of pixel applied to it. And I'll grab the area that I like. So maybe I like this area down here. And I'm grabbing more than I need, but that's fine. I'll control J to duplicate that, which pretty much isolates it on its own feathered layer. 
Control T, right click, flip horizontal. And now I can just drag it over here. And now you're getting a pretty symmetrical base. And you see ghosting issues happening up here. But still, let's make this flush. It actually looks pretty flush. Okay. And then what I would just do is give it a layer mask. You know, bring it a black brush. And just omit the layer wherever it's ghosting. So that was kind of a weird deal to do on this exposure because it wasn't really necessary. But you see how that made this completely symmetrical. These distances are symmetrical. And those are areas that can be pretty tricky. That's why I actually chose a watch for this because they're notoriously stubborn. Okay, so that's off to a pretty rocking start. One thing you may notice is I brought out some rulers. And the way I do that is Control R to bring up these. And then I drag down. And what I did is just made a bit of a plus over the dials to show you that they're not completely straight. They're crooked and I don't like crooked. So let's hide the extras here. And what I will do is I will, you know what, I'm going to make another base layer, believe it or not. Control J. That's something I often do. I duplicate a lot of base layers. So, I, you know, I salvage the editing properties of each layer. And I'll hit P to bring up my pen, which I've never used on workflow. This is the first ever time here seeing the pen tool. You know, I love my polygonal lasso tool. And I'm just going to make a really simple circular selection. And it won't spend a ton of time doing this. And of course, if your whole watch is crooked, you can just rotate the whole thing. But it's just the, you know, the whole body of the watch isn't looking that bad. So I just want to see if I can just do adjustment here. Okay, so that's a little crude, but it'll work. I'll go to my past dialog box, control, click the path. And I will make it a layer mask. So now, once again, we've isolated something. And I'm not going to rotate it yet. Because if I were to rotate it here, you see the axis is off. And it'll be really wobbly which isn't nice, but if I apply this layer mask first, then I hit control T, you'll see I can find the parameters to around the circle and you know, we're dead center. So now what I can do is micro rotate the head, maybe even with the extras out and just try to make sure that everything's really straight and you know, looking its best. So that's pretty subtle, but little things like that really matter. And when you bring out rulers, it's so easy to do in the modern age. I mean, why not just do that and make your item just look really pleasant from the viewer experience. So there's a few little tips and tricks to get where I am so far, and nothing magical there, but let's proceed into the color variance portion of this tutorial. So let's say your client had a silver version of this watch as well as gold, but everything else remained the same. Well, we could do that with a single exposure. What I would start by doing is hue saturation. And I'd like to do this with the product in front of me so I can make sure it's true to life, because obviously there's a bit of an ethical you know, dialogue surrounding this whole digital coloring thing, but you want to make sure things are accurate and, you know, things need to be accurate. So what I'll first do is go to yellows and I'll just desaturate the yellows and you'll see that almost gives us a perfect silver watch to begin with. Now with the watch in front of me, now you don't have it in front of me, but I do right now, I could turn the lightness up and see, you know, how dark or bright the metal is and sort of make it true to form. Now there's a little problem here. And that's that we unintentionally picked up some hue down here. And when the watch becomes silver, there's no reason for that color to change. It would still be the same color. So sometimes in combination with selecting hues, I'll apply digital masks and just mask out little areas that are being stubborn now. I won't even bring up the pen tool here. In fact, I'm going to do the sloppiest mask you've ever seen real quick. I'm a big fan of the polygonal lasso tool, I will say. Oh, I made a selection. I'll redo that. It's usually a combination of you know, digital masks and hue selections, that'll get you a pretty sound solution. But the good thing is, once you make this mask, you know, there's a real value in making the mask really airtight, because if you're producing multiple renders from it, you, you can spend the time to make the one render perfect, like breathtakingly perfect, and then just digitally apply all those color options, like silver, gold, or even rose gold, dare I say. So what I'm going to do is click here, Click in the mask, and I'm going to paste black. So that's not affected by that. Okay, and my masking was a little bit sloppy. You could get out a... You could get out a black mask. Oh, pardon me. A white brush. And holding shift, you can do straight lines. I'm just going to follow the perimeter of this watch. Holding shift to get straight lines. But the real solution here is to get a pretty nice mask off the get-go. Nice, and that's a pretty simple solution for a quick silver variant. But 
you know, there's so many scenarios where hue selection gets you like 99% of the way there. So I thought I have to share this workflow with you because it's such a good way to reduce your workload. Or maybe you just found it interesting how I tackled these problems for the first time using the melody cone. And I found it pretty interesting, the sort of creamy, milky nature of the metals it did provide. So please thumb up the video if you want to help out the channel. It's a pretty stellar way to do it. And I'll probably catch you here next week on Workflow. Until then, take care. Thank you.